I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, okay, I'm going to start. So I'm going to give two speeches this evening. Both of them are on the subject of organ donation, more specifically kidney donation. So I hope you've all been able to check out the, the keywords. I'm going to begin the first one, which is more general and give some statistics as well. Ladies and gentlemen, chronic kidney failure or CKF is now considered to be one of the major public health issues by the World Health Organization. In France, where I currently live, it affects nearly 82,000 people and reports suggest a 2% increase in the number of patients affected every year. There are two options when a kidney disease reaches its final stage, known as end stage renal disease or ESRD. The most common treatment is hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is a treatment to filter waste and water from your blood, just as a healthy kidney would do. Hemodialysis helps control blood pressure and balance important minerals such as potassium, sodium and calcium in your blood. The alternative treatment for people with ESRD or end stage renal disease is a kidney transplant. Medical authorities consider transplantation to offer a better quality of life compared to dialysis. In fact, transplantation makes it possible to restore almost normal kidney activity while maintaining an almost normal lifestyle. It is also worth noting that what was an experimental, risky and very limited treatment option 50 years ago is now routine clinical practice in more than 80 countries. Now let's take a look at where most kidney transplants are performed and the different ways to donate an organ. Firstly, most kidney transplants are carried out in the US and in Europe due to a larger pool of donors and better access to such procedures. But who are the organ donors? Well, organs can be donated either by a living donor or by a deceased donor, depending on the type of organ involved. Kidney donation is the most common type of living organ donation, or LOD, because it is possible to live a healthy life with just one kidney. In fact, on average, one person out of 1,000 is born with just one kidney. In this procedure, a healthy kidney is surgically removed from a living kidney donor, leaving one healthy kidney intact. And as I said, a person only needs one functioning kidney to live a healthy life. A living kidney donor will undergo comprehensive medical tests to ensure that he or she is compatible with the kidney recipient and healthy enough for surgery. If surgery is cleared for both the donor and the recipient, and all kidney transplant match criteria are met, and I'll talk more about this in the second speech, the donor will have a two to three hour surgery to remove one healthy kidney. That kidney will then be transplanted into the recipient. When successful, living kidney donor transplants, um, sorry, when successful, living kidney, kidney, kidney donor transplants last an average of 15 to 20 years, although I've read they can last up to 40 years. The benefits of living organ donation or LOD include the possibility of individuals suffering from kidney disease receiving a transplant prior to their dialysis therapy. And this is known as a preemptive transplant or shortly after their kidney failure, which is known as an early transplant. The benefits of preemptive and early transplants include reduced transplant rejection, improved life quality, and avoidance of dialysis therapy. Nevertheless, the physical, psychological, and social risks of LOD, combined with discrepancies in donor screening and donor recipient relationships in different countries, create a blurry environment for the protection of both donors and recipients. The World Health Organization provides information on acceptable practices for LOD, to help obtain safer and smoother applications worldwide. The other option is to receive a donation from a deceased donor, as deceased donation is when a healthy kidney comes from an organ donor who is recently deceased. In this case, a kidney from someone who has recently died is removed with the family's consent 
or indeed the individual's consent if he or she was a donor card holder. The donated kidney is either stored on ice or connected to a machine that provides oxygen and nutrients until the kidney is transplanted into the recipient. The donor and recipient are often in the same geographic region as the transplant centre to minimise the time the kidney is outside a human body. Organ donation frequency differs from country to country as laws that permit or refuse donation vary. Spain, the United States and Portugal have the highest rates of deceased organ donors worldwide. However, there are still high numbers of patients waiting for organ transplants. In the United States alone, there are almost 107,000 candidates waiting for organ donations, the majority of which require a kidney transplant. According to the US Division of Transplantation, which is the primary federal entity responsible for oversight of the transplant system, every day, 17 people die waiting for a transplant. And every nine minutes, another person is added to the waiting list. In the UK, 4,600 people, including nearly 100 children, are waiting for a kidney transplant. And this figure is expected to rise. Spain reaffirmed its global leadership in organ donation during 2019 and now accounts for 20% of EU donors and 6% worldwide. Spain is a very interesting example as a country that decided to operate a soft opt-out approach to organ donation decades before other countries followed suit. In fact, in 1979, Spain moved to a soft opt-out organ donor register, which is similar to the one that came into effect in Scotland and in England in 2020. But is it as simple as changing the organ donor registration system? With an opt-in system, people have to actively sign up to register to donate their organs after death. In opt-out systems, organ donation will occur automatically unless a specific request is made before death for organs not to be taken. Researchers from three universities in the UK recently analysed the organ donation systems of 48 countries for a period of 13 years. 23 countries using an opt-in system and 25 using an opt-out system. So a total of 48 countries. They found that countries using opt-out systems of organ donation had higher total numbers of kidneys donated. Opt-out systems also had the greater overall number of organ transplants. Opt-in systems did, however, have a higher rate of kidney donations from living donors. Spain's success in closing the gap between the organ supply imbalance is not solely explained by the opt-out system. According to medical professionals in Spain, there are many factors in the success of the Spanish model, from the opt-out system to continuous training of the doctors and nurses in every hospital. But the important thing is that it starts in the hospital. Transplant coordinators must be aware of the situation of their different patients. They also interview every family to find out what the patients themselves would have wanted. And then the important thing is that the family has trust in the system and trust in the doctors. As we've seen, the demand for kidneys far exceeds the supply. Breaking down these barriers to reduce the organ supply imbalance requires a multifaceted approach. Some of the key areas include increasing the potential donor pool and consent rates, apt organ allocation, and improving organ health. Additionally, suitable policies and standardised guidelines for both donors and recipients, alongside educational initiatives, are needed to ensure patient safety and global awareness. Measures must also be taken to avoid organ trafficking, transplant commercialism and transplant tourism. But these are topics for another speech. Thank you for your attention.